NASA has a helicopter and several rovers exploring the surface of Mars. China landed its own vehicle on the Red Planet and has its own exploration program. Back on Earth, Starship is making progress and moving fast to bring humans to space. These events make it easier to envision a scenario in which it will be possible to explore the Red Planet by millions of new residents. These are the humans that Elon Musk wants to move to Mars on his Starship, or even the colonies that Stephen Hawking envisioned moving to the Red Planet. Our destiny is in the stars. Space, here we come. For me it's not a question of whether we will become an interstellar species, but only a question of when. But not everybody shares these visions. And the skeptics include futurists, but also cosmologists, including colleagues of the late Stephen Hawking. At a recent virtual event for government leaders, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson and Lord Martin Rees, a British cosmologist, astrophysicist and a former president of the Royal Society, had both something to say about this scenario. In many occasions, Neil deGrasse Tyson has expressed admiration for Elon Musk, but is just not convinced about what it has been labeled as the terraformation of Mars. Take a listen. The idea that we're going to ship a billion people to another planet, or even thousands of people to another planet, on the premise that we need that for the species to survive catastrophe. Um, to just consider, you. but a moment ago you mentioned Captain Cook. Uh, do I need to remind people that half of his crew in his first voyage did not survive that first voyage? And by the way, he was sailing to places where when they got off their ship, they could breathe the air, all right? <laughs> the temperature was temperate for people. So, so um, the dangers that Martin speaks of are, are magnified in space by far. And if you want to call Mars home, yes, you would have to terraform it, right? My favorite word of the last several decades. Yes, turn Mars into Earth. But, uh, and you want to do that to escape climate change and problems here on Earth? If that's your goal, just consider, consider that whatever it takes to turn Mars into Earth, that's probably a bigger task than to turn Earth back into Earth. And that just echoes Martin's sentiment here. So I agree, um, both of us align in disagreement with Elon Musk and with um, the late Stephen Hawking on that. The same vision was shared by Martin Rees, who worked with Stephen Hawking. I'd like to say that space tourism, I think, is a phrase that should not be used. It should be space adventure, because it's never going to be safe to go into space. It's not, never going to be routine, and particularly if this is done, as I think it should be done, by private players, uh, Messrs. Bezos and Musk and people like that, then they're going to do it cheaper than NASA or um, the European Space Agency, and they'll be taking risk risk uh, uh, acceptance people, not people who are very cautious, and we'll cheer these people on. So if I was an American, I wouldn't support the manned space program. It's expensive because they've got to be so safe. They should leave it to people who are prepared to fly adventure, prepared to take risks. The comment is not as pessimistic as it sounds. In fact, Lord Reeves is supporting the exploration of Mars, but he wants to avoid the issues that stopped space exploration in the past. Take a listen. Uh, we know uh, that the space shuttle failed twice in, I think, 135 launches. That's less than 2% failure. But each of those failures was a big natural trauma in the America. It added extra cost and delayed the program by two or three years. Uh, whereas if uh, private adventurers crash, then, of course, we mourn brave and resourceful people, but that's uh, um, not going to delay future exploration. And we've got to think of space in the latter sense, I think, and not uh, the way the American public thought about the uh, two shuttle crashes. That's my point. Musk himself acknowledged recently that taking humans to Mars will cost lives. Yeah, going to Mars reads like that ad for, for, for Shackleton going to the Antarctic. You know, it's, it's dangerous, uh, it's uncomfortable, um, it's a long journey. You might not, you know, come back alive, um, but it's a glorious adventure, and uh, it'll be amazing, an, an amazing experience. And you're forever. We don't want to make anyone go, so it's like <laughs> volunteers only. And so it was to Neil deGrasse Tyson to bring back some optimism to the visions.
that at the dawn of, of aviation, that was one of the most dangerous things you could possibly do to get from A to B. And now it's one of the safest ways to get from A to B. So whatever is the risk factor now to require that we call going into space, space adventure rather than space tourism, it's not hard for me to imagine the day when space adventure becomes so safe that you bring grandma and the kids and no one is worried that you'll never come back. Regardless of who is traveling to Mars, for Lord Rees it seems unrealistic that a large number of people will live on the Red Planet. As to how many people will go, I'm skeptical for two reasons. The first reason is that the practical case for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time as robots get better. It's true that a human geologist could do a better job uh, than the Uh, the current probes on Mars, um, but in future that may not be the case. And uh, uh, fabricating big structures in space under zero G can perhaps best be done by robotic fabricators in future. So I think the only reason for going into space for humans is going to be as an adventure or as a tourist. Um, and uh, that's going to be sort of very expensive. And the question is how many people want to do that? Bearing in mind that it's uh, not very comfortable out there. Mars is a very hostile environment. And uh, the thing I certainly don't buy is an idea espoused by uh, Elon Musk and by my late colleague Stephen Hawking, that we should uh, expect that literally millions of people will go and settle on Mars um, as a way of escaping Earth's problems. I think that's a dangerous delusion because dealing with... Uh, climate change on Earth, for instance, is a doddle compared to making Mars habitable. Living on Mars is no better than living at the South Pole or on the ocean bed or at the top of Everest. And millions of people don't want to do that. So I think it's unrealistic to expect huge numbers of people to want to go and live on Mars. And of course, uh, the fabrication of uh, structures on the Moon and on Mars can be done by future generations of robotic fabricators. So I think the case for sending people is going to be just the experience and the adventure. At a different session of the same event, celebrated futurist Paul Safford had something to say on this topic too. Turns out there are actually four kinds of people in this conversation. The ones who say, turn the clock back, call them druids. The ones who say, let's race ahead and fix it, call them engineers. The third category, call them astronauts, say, well, let's go to Mars and start all over again. Um, my feeling about that is, if we can't fix Earth, we're sure as heck not going to do a better job on Mars. And besides, Mars is really not a very fun place to be. The atmosphere is carbon dioxide and the atmospheric pressure is one one hundredth of the top of Everest. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I want to live there. There is, however, a fourth possibility, and that is a perspective of a gardener. You know, a gardener is someone who would look at this problem and say, well, the situation is really screwed up, but patient attention and small steps can fix it. So a gardener would say, just work on it steadily year after year and turn things back to something that is more habitable and avoid the big dramatic moves of engineers because big dramatic engineering moves inevitably have big dramatic unintended consequences. So then, why bother to go to Mars? Here are a few reminders. There is no force on Earth as potent as the exploration of space is on people's ambitions to become scientists, engineers, mathematicians, the, the STEM fields, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. When we go out into space, either with people or with robots, but especially with people, then others see that. And it is the frontier of, of, of every one of the sciences that has shaped the civilization that we live in. And if you recognize that the foundations of tomorrow's economy will pivot on the innovations in the STEM fields, and you want to now excite people to enter the STEM fields, there's nothing like going to space to do that. In the 1960s, during the Apollo uh, uh, ascent to the moon, 
you the number of people who wanted to major in science and teachers that wanted it, it was a, it was a force operating unto itself and so much came out of that decade in terms of innovation in the united states for having been inspired by that and i will add that the future just thinking about the future is half of what drives that um, when you look at the World's Fair in New York in the 1960s and all the futuristic buildings and the and 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 the the the, the video telephone, I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember this. You say, "Wow, that's a future that I want." What can? How can I be a part of it? Oh, by the way, we're going to the moon. Imagine if those forces were operating in all countries around the world. You'll bring tomorrow here today. But there is another compelling reason. Lord Martin Rees explains it. To find life on Mars, or maybe elsewhere in our solar system, would be crucially important, even a vestige of some simple life. Because if we find that, that tells us straight away that life isn't a rare fluke. It says that it happened twice with one solar system, and that would have the momentous conclusion that life must exist in literally billions of places in our Milky Way galaxy. It started twice in one solar system, then we know there are literally billions of planetary systems in our galaxy, but it starts on those two. So until we find life elsewhere, we can't rule out the possibility that life is a rare fluke unique to the Earth. And that's why it's so important to look for life, first on Mars, relics of dead life on Mars has been looked for by these probes now, um, and also look in other places. I mean, the popular places are uh, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, for instance. But that's, I think, if you ask most people, and uh, Neil, I'm sure, gets asked these more than I do, what's important in space? Are we alone and all that? That's the most important uh, question, I think, for both the uh, lay people, but also, I think, for most specialists as well. <laughs>